Mimi sawa unajua mimi ndakuongojea wewe. It's okay. It's okay, you're the one that start off. Yeah, it's now streaming live. We are now live on the Facebook. So, let's wait for 5 minutes and then we start. Yeah. I see one person has joined. Let's give them time. Five minutes and then you start. That's okay. I see five people, share, share the link. We need more people here. Thank you, Dr. Mihindo, for joining. Welcome. Karibuni sana, we are giving people two minutes, we start. Uh, Grace, we have one minute, so prepare for introductions. At exactly 10 or 5, we start. All right. All right.
And Grace, you're free to start. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our today's uh, training, Refresher. And uh, we shall be handling the soils. And as you all know, it is the core of farming, and that is why we are giving it the attention that it deserves. Our topic today will be handled by myself, Ferdinand Wafula, and Samuel Nerito. So we shall be working together to ensure that you get as much information as you can. I would like to invite our um, viewers from uh, Kenya, all over Kenya, our, master, our multipliers from every region. I'm also taking an opportunity to welcome our brothers and sisters from the Eastern Africa community. I saw people from, from Rwanda yesterday. We had Uganda, Tanzania, and all the other parts that I've not men mentioned. I'm taking this opportunity to welcome all of us. Be free to ask questions at the end of the presentation. And also you can ask for any clarification. Your contribution will also be appreciated. I also want to appreciate the master trainers in our mid who joint. We have uh, Dr. Mihindo Karibusana. And uh, without further ado, mm -hmm. allow me to welcome Karibusana and Rito, uh, Nehemiah. Allow me to welcome our first presenter, Mr. Ferdinand Wafula, to take us through for the next half an hour. Karibu Wafula. Thank you, Grace. And uh, thank you for uh, Kalam. Uh, Kenya, thank you for um, the Knowledge Hub uh, for Organic Agriculture Project, for organizing this. Uh, refresher trainings for uh, multipliers. Uh, I hope you had uh, good reflections on uh, yesterday's presentations, on the introductions, and um, I hope that uh, we're going to delve uh, deeper into some of the practice um, and the science related to soils uh, within the uh, agroecology introduction that we had uh, yesterday. Uh, my name is uh, Ferdinand Wafula, as uh, introduced by my um, fellow master trainer. I work for an organization called Biogardening Innovations. We are based in Western Kenya, and uh, we also members of Pelham. I'm also a practitioner and agroecology practitioner, and happy to share with you some of the insights and um, this presentation, uh, their emphasis on uh, knowledge uh, areas that uh, you as a multiplier are expected to have some good background. And there are some um, um, emphasis on uh, practices that you are expected to uh, share with the farmers. Um, Um, the objective of this um, presentation is to have a deep understanding on soil fertility management options and encourage living soils. Having said that, uh, we can ask ourselves some questions. What makes the soil come alive or dead? What are the characteristics and composition of living soils? Then how do you mimic nature? and encourage soil fertility. We would like to ask ourselves those questions by the end of this um, session that we should be able to um, answer this. And uh, these are important questions to raise when you are also facilitating and training farmers so that uh, when they answer these questions, you will know that um, there's some knowledge uh, shared, there's some practice uh, that is uh, being um, uh, implemented, uh, that is important uh, for achieving uh, the objective for this uh, 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 project. And uh, there is um, this quote from uh, Vandana Shiva. Uh, you know, she's uh, a scientist, a food activist from uh, India, that hope 
is not a thing outside us. Hope is a process of living. And uh, I cultivate, she cultivates hope in every thought and every action. Uh, we are aware that uh, we are doing this work against many odds, but we are very hopeful that uh, things are changing and things will be changing. Things cannot remain the same and things will be changing. And part of uh, this training, part of this uh, refresher and part of this uh, project is in the hope that uh, things are going to change and that we are going to have our food system aligned to nature and um, that we are going to be free and to be freed uh, rather than being uh, slaves of people who control uh, the food system, the current food system. Now, we will uh, start straight by looking at uh, our soil profi profile. And uh, this is to remind ourselves about uh, the existence of um, our soil um, and, 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 and how this soil is arranged. Uh, from uh, top uh, to bottom. Uh, we see it in horizons, or we can say in layers. And uh, the very first layer is very important uh, because this is the, the living layer. This is where we have uh, plants growing, uh, trees. And uh, when we say plants, we mean um, Vegetation includes what is edible, what is not edible. And for our case, as an agriculturalist, what is edible is very important, but at the same time, even what is not edible is very important. So this is the deposition layer. It's a active plant root layer, especially for annuals. Most of the annual crops, I, I'm sure you are aware when we talk about annuals and perennials, uh, these are crops that have uh, grow within a short season and uh, they do not uh, develop very deep roots uh, up to about one foot. Um, then we have uh, a second layer. This uh, is the active layer for deep rooted perennials and uh, area of uh, leached minerals. We'll see later about minerals and about uh, what this uh, deposition layer. When we talk about deposition, what do we mean by that? And then we have uh, horizon uh, C, if you, or three. This is a very deep rooted uh, tree zone uh, where we have uh, Mm, deep rooted trees and and those that grow uh, up to height of up to uh, 30 meters. Uh, this is uh, their, their, their horizon. And then we got the horizon four. This is actually the bedrock. And uh, it's, it's an area uh, composed of uh, the parent uh, bedrock, uh, which actually defines uh, the type of soil in that uh, particular uh, area. Um, it's also good to have a background of uh, soil structure and texture. This is how soil feels. And uh, the structure and texture uh, gives uh, the soil uh, some of its property, especially uh, water holding capacity, uh, its ability to hold air, its color, uh, even the minerals uh, present. We'll see later again uh, what these minerals do and how this uh, uh, relationship between minerals and uh, organic matter and uh, uh, living organisms uh, relate in order for us to cultivate uh, living soils. So we can talk about granular uh, structure, blocky structure, uh, prismatic uh, structure, a columnar structure, plate structure, and single grain structure. This can be observed in different parts of the world. And uh, there are, as, as a result of um, uh, formation, art formation uh, structures, um, 
mainly through uh, rock formation, metamorphic, um, weathering processes, and um, this defines uh, soils in different parts uh, of the world. And we also, uh, uh, it's important for us uh, to also uh, learn about uh, classification of soils. Soils can be classified according to some of these uh, uh, properties, uh, uh, when they are granular or blocky and, uh, and, and their texture, uh, the size of the grain particles, the size of uh, what we see here, um, the prisms, the, uh, the blocks, uh, will, will, will give them a certain uh, uh, classification. And this is an in internationally uh, accepted uh, classification by aggregate, the size or the percentage of aggregate of uh, clay, silt, and sand, such that uh, when we have um, a certain soil with, uh, just to know how this works, if you look on the, on the left, uh, where you have a silt, and you have a certain um, soil that has uh, has a sixty percent uh, silt and uh, forty percent clay, you would say you would call that uh, silty clay. Where you have uh, on the extreme uh, left hand uh, corner. 90% silt and 20% sand, then that is a silt. And on the extreme uh, right, uh, on your light, on your on your left, uh, in this case, where you have 90% sand and 10% uh, uh, clay, that is a sand, sandy soil. So that uh, you hear people talk about uh, sandy loam sandy clay or uh, sandy clay, sandy, sandy loam. Uh, this is actually because of uh, that classification by aggregate. And uh, you can see from uh, the right where you have silt, uh, this, this is green, and then you have dark green, then you have loam, which is brown. So this is the extreme end of very, very, very fertile soil. And, uh, and, and as we come to sandy clay red, which is not uh, very suitable for agriculture uh, production, and we have clay also. And uh, in between here, this is actually what is desired. And uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, understanding on what to do in order to achieve this in our farmland is of critical importance. Um, by appearance, uh, we can uh, see this appearance in our day-to-day -day observation in our fields. And uh, I'm sure um, many people will observe uh, this is sand, but it has different, uh, this is not the only color. It may also be, 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 be dark, but has got uh, bigger aggregates. And uh, some of this clay, uh, when it's dry, this is how it, uh, it behaves. And uh, loamy soil, and as I, I showed in that uh, uh, graphic, uh, its aggregate consists of uh, lots of uh, silt, about 60%, 90% uh, are uh, silt. So this also, the color also, um, uh, we, can, we can find uh, from the, uh, the soil atlas. And this can also help us actually know that this color is just not for nothing, but it also means the prevalence of minerals, uh, which are important in characterizing uh, these soils. I hope I'm not very fast uh, for most of our, of our viewers from other uh, countries. And in case there's any, um, I mean, I'm, I'm being fast, uh, Ratemo, or Misoi, you can uh, let me know and I can slow down. So far, so good. I hope uh, we're on track. Um, before we look at the composition of these soils, what are some of these uh, soil destructive 
uh, practices. Uh, growing of only one crop uh, in a continuous cycle, uh, otherwise called monocropping, is one such uh, destructive practice. Burning of organic matter and uh, use of synthetics in the form of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, deforestation, and displacing uh, more native trees with exotic, uh, uh, exotic ones, or those that are alien, not treatable in those particular areas, overgrazing. Remember, I'm talking about overgrazing, not overstocking. And then man-made structures like road constructions and buildings. And uh, if we talk about uh, soil destructive practices, and we are in agreement, uh, when we invert this, then we'll would be uh, talking about soil building uh, practices. It's good for us uh, and for multipliers to know when uh, facilitating some of these soil destructive practices, uh, that when you invert this, then you actually are going to uh, build soils. Um, we can see a lot of degradation happening, uh, especially when we're having rainy season, like now, uh, on, on hillsides. And uh, not only during uh, uh, rainy uh, seasons, but uh, even during the dry seasons, because um, soil naturally uh, has cover, is covered by green vegetation, uh, which is very, very important. That is nature. Nature just provides that uh, soil gets clothed with the green vegetation and of uh, different species. And the way uh, the soil is covered uh, above ground is also uh, reflected um, below ground uh, through the, the root system and the root uh, network. Um, some characteristic and composition of living soils. Um, we talk about organic matter. This is the first M. And then we talk about minerals, the second M. And we talk about uh, microbial life. So when uh, we are working on soils uh, um, through agriculture, we are also balancing uh, these three uh, things. And when we balance these three things, that is when we talk about fertile soils. When they are in balance and we are able to grow our crops and they do not show a deficiency symptoms of minerals, they do not, they show a lot of um, uh, microbial life and organic matter is uh, present, then we can talk about uh, having achieved uh, soil fertility. So we can look at uh, each of those uh, elements and uh, how the, the, their functions and uh, how they come about uh, with, with an intention of uh, understanding how we can uh, mimic how nature works. So we start with the soil organic matter and uh, it's important to talk about trees. And uh, this is actually referred to as the miracle of life because trees are the only um, living organisms that can be able to make their own food. And uh, for such, they are actually called primary producers uh, in the food web. In the presence of uh, sun, uh, these uh, trees will actually uh, do what is called phot photosynthesis. And the process of photosynthesis generally is about uh, making food, it's about making uh, sugars. And uh, these sugars are important uh, in the presence of light uh, together with the carbon dioxide uh, that will actually uh, give us uh, organic matter. Uh, it will convert, the sugars are conv converted into um, the organic uh, matter. So some of the factors that also support those uh, properties uh, for the trees to function well in terms of um, uh, doing photosynthesis are like temperature, uh, moisture, carbon dioxide, oxygen, light, and, uh, and, and water. So when we look at uh, how uh, photosynthesis uh, 
works uh, is that uh, the production of uh, of uh, the sugars, uh, which is actually a fuel or energy for the tree, uh, a tree or a crop will produce 80% of this uh, for self-maintenance. And it will uh, also exudate between 15 to 20% uh, of that sugar in form of, uh, and, and some of the sugars are actually uh, stored, the 80% are actually stored um, as, uh, as, as, as uh, long-term uh, provision of energy in form of uh, starch. And we can see that in roots, in the seeds, uh, in the stems. Uh, for example, in the roots of uh, tubers, uh, this is what we consume as sweet potato, as arrow roots in the form of stem. This is what we consume in, in terms of um, uh, uh, crops like uh, sugarcane. And uh, we also see that this 20% exudate is usually exchanged with microbes. Uh, we have an example of microbes like yeast, bacteria, fungi, protozoa. They are all present uh, in the soil. So this, uh, this just uh, uh, example and uh, understanding of this uh, uh, biochemistry is very important uh, uh, for us to actually cultivate uh, living soils. I hope I'm not losing anybody and uh, we are on track. Pratemo, uh, is anybody lost? Is uh, there any concern? Misoi, are we together? Can we proceed? Yes, Ferdinand, we are together. Please proceed. Proceed. Thank you. Um, so uh, when we look at uh, now the living uh, plants, so when they're doing uh, photosynthesis and all the living things, uh, uh, die and decay. We also uh, uh, understand another concept here about deposition is that upon death of all these uh, plants, there is deposition, there is decomposition, and there is also redistribution, redistribution. But what is this redistribution? We can talk about the 3D, deposition, decomposition, and re uh, redistribution. And um, plants have their own cycle, and uh, those older leaves will uh, start the deposition. Once they've done enough photosynthesis and um, they, are, they, are, they are exhausted, just like uh, any other uh, person, if you are a runner uh, or you are using, uh, an, uh, you are using uh, a sulfuria, and, and there's a lot of work that it does. After some time, it actually um, um, uh, degenerates and then it's, it's of no use. So uh, nature has it that those living things are uh, like plants, especially the lower leaves will start, will start uh, deposition and then they will start decomposition. And eventually some of the nutrients that are con um, contained in them will be uh, redistributed. Then let us look at what is being redistributed. We now talk about uh, minerals as a second component of uh, the soil. And these uh, minerals, we have about 92 of them. They determine the physiological functions uh, of plants. And uh, in terms of when we talk about the physiological functions of plants, this is about the color, uh, the flowering, the rooting, the extent to which uh, crops can do the rooting and even the fruiting. It is important when we are uh, talking about soils and even mimicking nature uh, to farmers to understand that um, it is uh, the role of minerals uh, in supporting in, uh, and in, in being available in balanced quantities. Sir that we have a difference either uh, for the crops that we want to harvest the leaves 
uh, either to have um, uh, those crops uh, achieving full um, potential of their growth uh, for flowering plants so that we have seeds like beans, uh, sunflower and other which actually become our food and for the rooting um, and also for the footing. The absence of some uh, mineral minerals leads to uh, symptoms of deficiency. And then uh, these minerals are actually processed through uh, weathering of rocks. And uh, we talk about chemical weathering, uh, biological weathering, and physical weathering. And chemical weathering is actually the combination of um, water and uh, this, these minerals, the 92 that I'm talking about, um, in the presence of uh, the other physical factors like air, temperature, uh, that will degenerate the rocks and break them down. We can also talk about biological, the growing of uh, plants and the existence of uh, animals and organic matter as an impact on the, on, on the parent bedrock. Uh, and then the physical uh, processes includes uh, man-made activity and, and other animal uh, activities. So those uh, are actually uh, part of what forms the soil and the weathering processes, the soil that we see right now uh, has been weathered for, I mean, uh, weathering process continues and it's been as a result of millions and millions of years that we have the soils. And this is important because uh, the characteristics of the soils that we have in a given area are as a result of these um, chemical properties of particular rocks, especially of the parent bedrock in a particular area. We have uh, places where people say our soils are very dark. In other places, they are very white uh, or brown. It is as a result of um, the chemical uh, process, I mean, the chemicals, the minerals that are present in those, uh, in that particular area, the parent uh, bedrock. We see areas like where we have uh, volcanic uh, activity. It's a combination of both physical and, uh, and chemical processes where we have uh, um, very deep rocks that have been uh, uh, pushed out. And then we see that uh, some of these areas are very, very, very fertile, like Mount Kenya region, like uh, the Mao region, Mount Elgon, uh, those, those places with um, uh, volcanic uh, activity. But then uh, some of those um, uh, areas don't just remain like that because of the other factors that uh, I've mentioned, um, man-made factors like monocropping and 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 continuous planting and this has degenerated these places sir, such that those soils are not uh, as originally uh, established i have a question for you can you name some uh, minerals and their functions uh, to plant health if you post that on the chat then uh, I know Ratema or uh, Misoi will be able to, to give me one or two. Can we do that just in uh, a few seconds? Yes, Any please questions? post please post on the chat and I will read it out for the trainers. If you know the answer, please post. If not wrong or correct, we are all learning. Eh? Any 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 answers uh, posted? Not yet. Oh, there is. There is. Yes, we saw it. Yeah, Lipson Emmanuel has said phosphorus for root formation. And then Christ Tipal calcium for strengthening the plants. So that those are the answers so far. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's good to to mention some of this, uh, even when we are training farmers, that uh, we 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 talk about uh, uh, phosphorus because they will hear about uh, 
a certain fertilizer called um, DAP, and uh, it has a meaning. Uh, those synthetics, and um, we 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 need to point out that these are actually minerals that are found in the soil, and there are those that are essential, and others that are trace. But uh, when they are absent or they are in too uh, large quantities, then there will be some deficiencies and the plant would not grow as desired. Uh, so we can talk about uh, phosphorus, which uh, is uh, a mineral or an element that uh, forms the structure, uh, the cell structure of all living things um, uh, contains uh, phosphorus. And it's also essential in um, uh, energy metabolism. Uh, when I say energy metabolism, I, say, I, I mean the, uh, the workings. When photosynthesis occurs, uh, phosphorus is, is required in that process of making uh, the sugars. We have uh, other elements like nitrogen, which is essential in um, the green color of uh, our, our, our crops. This green color is called uh, chlorophyll. And it's the one that attracts um, energy uh, from the sun for this uh, chemical um, process to, to, to occur. So this is important for us to understand in relation to the elements, because later when we look at the functions of uh, organic of, of um, the living organisms in the soils, then the transfer and exchange of this um, uh, elements is very important in ensuring that there is balance uh, in the soil. So for those who are uh, still posting, thank you. And for those who have uh, posted, thank you. Uh, it's good to uh, get deeper into understanding uh, some of those um, uh, elements. We have about uh, eight of them that are essential and other eight that are uh, at rest. Uh, about 16 of them that are very important uh, for um, for plant healthy uh, plant uh, growth. Um, so let us look at uh, the microbes and their importance in, uh, in in soil biology and in cultivating the living soils. Um, we have what we see when we talk about soil organisms. Uh, the larger soil organisms uh, like, uh, like spiders, like, uh, like mites, like uh, millipedes, like uh, earthworms. And then we have the soil, the micro, the micro ones, those that we cannot see by our eyes. Um, like bacteria, like uh, fungi, like algae. And uh, these are important, the larger soil organisms as well as the uh, smaller uh, soil organisms are important. Um, the larger uh, organisms are important because they pull uh, dead biomass into the soil, uh, physically um, pulling and, and pushing and uh, feed on organic matter materials and then mix them uh, with the soil. Uh, they also dig tunnels and facilitate aeration and drainage. Uh, our best example is actually uh, earthworm. And then the soil microorganisms, uh, the, the very small ones, uh, they actually decompose organic matter um, improve the soil structure, make nutrients available to plants and protect the plants from disease attack. So we'll look at uh, some, just in some, some little detail about uh, how this, especially the uh, microorganisms in uh, transferring uh, soil nutrients and their association with plants in doing that. How do they do that? So we can, uh, Talk about that association uh, of those um, uh, larger um, organisms and the smaller organisms in terms of uh, a soil food web. They are in a relationship. This is how nature uh, has it, that uh, 
when we have the sun um, producing energy uh, on, uh, on, on plants through photosynthesis, then uh, the decay, the death and the decay of these um, uh, plants into organic matter, the organic matter becomes food uh, for uh, bacteria. So this first level here, we call it the first um, uh, trophic level. Uh, this is where the first level we, we have energy, the very first energy uh, from the sun transferred into the plants. This is the first trophic level. The second trophic level, uh, we have the bacteria, the fungi um, feeding on uh, organic, organic matter and also nematodes. Then the third trophic level is where the protozoa and nematodes also feed on bacteria and the fungi. And then we have the fourth tropic level where we have now some of the larger uh, microbes that we can see like nematodes uh, that feed on, uh, on, on, on protozoa, which were fed on uh, bacteria and bacteria that fed on organic matter. And then the fifth uh, or higher uh, tropic level is where we have animals uh, that feed on uh, those uh, fourth tropic levels. And we can also talk about uh, in this uh, fifth, you can see this is an area where even man appears because you have man who feeds on, uh, on birds. And uh, remember, uh, chicken, these are birds. And there are people who also feed on uh, anthropods and uh, even uh, insects. In Western Kenya, we, we, we have the white ants, the termites. So that is the, we, we also, man is within this fifth or higher level, higher tropic uh, uh, level. Um, it's important for us to keep this uh, soil food web. And when we are mimicking nature, this is actually what we are uh, mimicking. I hope we are together, we are still together. And uh, when you're looking at this soil food web, I mean, this uh, soil, food web you can also uh, get to or, or on your internet and 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 connect with Elaine Elaine Ingram and you can have more resources and more learning about uh, the soil food web now why are these micro microbes uh, important example uh, like mycorrhiza they live in a symbiotic relationship with the plants. They have mutual benefit when we talk about symbiosis. Uh, they also enlarge the surface area of roots and penetrate uh, um, soil pores uh, so that they're in connection with the root. Then they support the plants in taking up nutrients and water. Uh, they also improve the soil structure and preserve moisture but they are also sensitive to chemical fertilizers and, and pesticides. But how do they exactly do this? Just, just to mention something for, for your information when you talk about um, enlarging the surface area. So some of the uh, fungi actually have got what we call hyphae. They are interconnected. Uh, and that interconnection, um, when they are connected with the roots, elongates um, it, it's kind of an extension of the roots so that uh, when we look at a uh, natural uh, forest there's a lot of that connection and you can see that when we have uh, smaller trees and uh, and bigger trees and those that actually are um, lightly rooted and those that are heavily rooted they are all connected and uh, they, they, they all have uh, different needs at different times. There are those that are just germinating and there are those that are well germinated. There are those that are flowering. And um, so they, their connection is important in the distribution of those nutrients. Because uh, I did mention about the uh, existence of uh, the relationship and the exchange uh, of the sugars. That is very important for the microbes because it's the microbes that like the sugars. Huh? 
in exchange of the in exchange of the minerals uh, because the minerals are important for their existence and they're also important for the existence of um, of the crops huh? so when the bacteria for example when they they ingest some of these um, uh, minerals uh, uh, in combination of the acids they melt the natural uh, organic acids they melt them and uh, and utilize them for their own bodies uh, then when they die uh, that 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 is left into the soil uh, and it's taken up by other other microorganisms it's like you have a grit and then other microorganisms like fungi uh, kind of built uh, those grit into bricks into cramps and uh, and then um there is uh, a process uh, where the microorganisms uh, now release these uh, nutrients to plants in a process called uh, chelation. So the exudate uh, is taken up by the microorganisms and uh, the microorganisms release uh, some of those uh, nutrients. Uh, for example, a, a nutrient like uh, phosphorus can only, only, and I mean only, uh, be done naturally uh, through the relationship between um, uh, microorganisms and plants. It can be solubilized because it exists in nature in an insoluble uh, manner, in an insoluble state. And uh, it can only be solubilized uh, through that uh, process uh, relationship between plants and, uh, and, 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 and the microorganisms. And that is important in now talking about um uh living soils because if uh we're saying soils are sensitive to chemical fertilizers and pesticides because these pesticides uh, will also kill uh those microorganisms and in uh, in doing so then you are also killing a natural process you're also killing the whole of that structure uh the food web that we are talking about so that um when you're having some of the plants why do we insist on the native plants and plants that are uh, related to a particular area and not exotics? Is because uh, through a process of evolution, uh, the microorganisms that are present in a place like, let's say, Western Kenya, let's say Kakamega forests, have existed there for millions and millions of years. And when you uh, have those native plants there, it means they have very good um, symbiotic relationship uh, with those. Um, plants there so that reviving uh, local or indigenous foods just reminds those microbes that are present there that oh guy we were friends um so let's let's continue our business let's do uh, our trade so that the the relationship between the sugar and uh, mineral uh, exchanges uh, takes place and this is important now uh, for us uh, promoters of uh, organic or agroecology because um, this is actually now the science behind why we would insist that uh, um, we, we actually use natural processes, use um, organic processes in enabling uh, soil health. Um, some of those practices, and I'm coming to a uh, close, uh, that mimic nature in terms of uh, having this all this combination includes uh, uh, composting, green manure, mulching, uh, having crop diversity. And having crop diversity is important because we have, uh, we only know a, a, a minute, uh, we only know a fraction of uh, the microbes that exist. And uh, our biologists uh, inform us that every plant that you see uh, has got it's it's has got it's associated with a certain type of microbes, such that crop diversity is very important uh, for us to have diverse microbes. And some of these microbes are also uh, part of what protects plants and also protects uh, humans because of that relationship, the symbiotic relationship I was talking about. Um, last but not list um there are those practices that uh, encourage and uh, help in managing uh, the living soils 
uh, like uh, contouring, planting on contours, and uh, using um, uh, swells or terracing. Uh, others call it fanyaju, fanyachining, having uh, stone barriers, just to make sure that we have strategies that um, encourage us to have more living soils. And then we also have recently uh, a lot of practicals on fermented uh, biofertilizers so that we can be able to culture uh, some of those uh, very good uh, microbes and introduce them uh, into our soil so that we can hasten that process or that symbiotic uh, relationship. And then we have um, other strategies like composting, vermicompost, and the liquid teas, which my colleagues are going to uh, highlight. Otherwise, thank you for following uh, the discussion. And uh, I will uh, now hand it back to my colleagues. Um, Misoi, if you are there, uh, thank you so much yes. for listening. And uh, I hope you will reserve some questions later uh, after uh, my colleagues have also um, are done with their presentation. Thank you so much. Karibu sana Ferdinand and thank you for the powerful presentation that we've had. Allow me to also recognize some of the experts we have in our Zoom. We have um, Esther Kirudi. We have uh, uh, we have uh, Esther. We have Sam. We have Mihindo. We have uh, Fr Robert Gulova and uh, Josephine. Who else? I've seen a number of people joining us in uh, WhatsApp, in our Zoom meeting. Thank you so much for joining. Those are our experts in our meetings. And also I want to appreciate the numbers. The number is growing on our um, Facebook page. Allow me now to share my screen as I take you to the next part before we are joined by our final presenter who will be Sam Derito. So once my screen is on, Ratemo, you can uh, signal so that I know you can access my screen. We can see. Let me put it in presentation mode. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's OK. All right. All right. So I now want to take you through the strategies that we can imply to attain and manage soil health. As my colleague has said clearly on uh, the processes, now I want to share with us the strategies. And as an introduction, I would like to, to remind all our multipliers that soil is the foundation for profitable, productive, and environmentally sound food systems. So unless we have uh, healthy soils, production will go down hence productivity, and at the same time, we will affect our environment. So when you're taking care of the soils, always pay attention to other, other conditions that depend on the soils. It is also important to understand the physical, the chemical, and biological components of healthy soil and how to manage them. And I'm glad my colleague has expounded on that, the physical, chemical, biological, he has really explained so well. Now, for us to have a healthy soil, we need, we need to consider the nutrient cycling. The way we do in our household to ensure that we have food security. So during harvest time, we do store our foods for the dry period. Others do value addition. For example, you would even dry vegetables to be used during the dry season. So the same way we take care of our food security in the household level, we also need to look at storage of nutrients for our soils. And um, to, take, to take us to our next point, when I talk of nutrient cycling, I refer to the many pathways through which nutrients are either added, removed, or changed within the soils. So it is clearly indicated here that it can either be added, it can be removed, 
or it can be changed within the soils. Therefore, it is important for us to realize the pathways and manage the pathways properly. So, as a storage means, every farmer should always remember the soil solutions. Do we have enough um, nutrients in our soil that can dissolve in the water within the soil so that it is available for our crops? So it is important that we consider soil solutions. The other storage is in composting. Most of the farmers do composting just for the period of planting. At times, it is not even enough. That is why you find farmers using compost that is not fully decomposed, and uh, it brings about other issues and other problems, and they end up complaining that compost is not working. Are we doing compost at the right time? So composting should always be a process that is within any farm setup, and especially an agroecological farm for our case. The other thing is mineralization. Always, as we do our farming, we need to have a store for our minerals. And when I talk of mineralization, I refer to the converting of organic nit nitrogen to plant available ammonia. For example, yesterday, uh, as Sam was answering one of the questions, he mentioned about the carbon crops and other crops that when they are decomposed, they avail nutrients to the crops. So it is important that you always consider the mineral aspect. Most of our farmers would concentrate on all the other nutrients and forget about the minerals. Talk about uh, some of the fertilizers, uh, organic fertilizers that we make to subsidize, to, to come to contribute to what we use in our farms to, sup to supply uh, minerals. For example, we talked about Bokashi during our trainings and we realized that we were using a lot of rock dust. So it is important that we consider the mineral element and ensure that we have a storage of that. And as I said, by planting crops, because different crops when they decompose will give us different nutrients. So it is important for us to look at the diversity. The other storage of nutrients in our soil is through organic matter. It is very important that we always add organic matter to our soils to ensure that we have enough storage. And the beauty about organic matter is that it is a long term. So if I supplied organic matter to the, to, to the soil for this planting season, I am almost sure that I'll have a bit of the same during the next planting season. So being constant and consistent in applying organic matter to the soil. And finally, we also need to consider the fermentations, the ferments. It is important that we always have this as storage facilities to supply nutrients to our soils. So when you go out there training farmers, always ensure that they have the five components of storage facilities as I have discussed. The other thing that is very important as a strategy is regulation of air and water in the soil. Soil is a complex ecosystem whereby living organisms and plant roots bind mineral particles, organic matter together into a dynamic structure that regulates water, air, and nutrients. Therefore, look at this factory. It is very dynamic. It is binding, it is breaking down, and in the process, it is regulating water, air, and nutrients. So therefore, our soil structure, as explained by um, Ferdinand, is very important, as the, the layers of uh, soil particles will give us macropores, and note that macropores is responsible for aeration. So when we have micropores, air is able to circulate freely in the soil. We also get the micropores. micropores. These are responsible for holding and spreading water in the soil. This should explain to us why it is very important that we have uh, structures to manage 
soil in our farms. Because when we have a lot of water in our farm, we shall be having a problem with leaching because we shall be getting extra water, the water that we do not need at that moment. And in the process, it will affect on the soil structure. So always remind our farmers to manage water in the farm. Talk about drainage. Talk about the crops, the choice of crops that will help in sinking water and enabling, and, uh, enabling us have a storage of water underground other than water uh, at the surface of the soil. So please pay attention to that. The other strategy that we need to imply is on the management practices. This is one area that needs the attention of each and every one of us. The management practices, what farmers do. As, um, as I introduced myself previously, I happen to come from the uh, western part of Kenya. And uh, the first point really affects most of the parts of western Kenya, like uh, we need to reduce on soil traffic. Can you imagine at the processes that happens at our farms before we end up planting? For example, you find farmers doing the first plowing, second plowing, arrowing, and then now come in with machinery, do the planting, and then um, manage of pests and diseases, talk about them. The kind of soil traffic in our farms. What we need to do is to reduce as much as we can. How can we do this? We ensure that almost every area of our, of, of our farm is utilized so that we don't have to, stay, to step on, uh, on the farm every time. And as I indicated earlier, one of the management practices also is increase in organic matter input. Always, whatever comes from our farm, the nutrient circle, let us consider that if we feed our, our livestock with the fodder, whatever remains, let it come back to the farm. And when we are harvesting our crops, what we, are, what we cannot utilize in the kitchen or in the market, let us take that back to the soil. So let us increase organic matter input. The other thing that is very important is use of cover crops. I talked earlier about reducing soil traffic. Can you imagine if we had cover crops? Even in our maize plantations, can we plant uh, pumpkins, for example, and have pumpkins running in our maize field? Those would encourage us not to step on the farm, hence reducing on soil traffic, but at the same time, we are covering our soils. The importance of covering our soils is we there'll be minimal exposure to sunlight, hence loss of water. Talk about the microbial life in the soil. We shall be protecting, protecting them from uh, extreme weather conditions. And at the same time, control of uh, weeds. We don't have to do weeding when we have cover crops. It helps us in controlling that. So even the intensity of the work at the farm will reduce drastically if we use cover crops. The other strategy is reduce reduction in pesticide use. I know my colleagues, um, Dr. Mihindo and the team will talk about this at length in their lesson, but allow me to just mention in passing that the use of uh, pesticides in our farms is contributing to unhealthiness of our soils. For example, when you spray your crops with pesticides, you're not just killing the, spe the specific uh, pest that you wanted, but also the beneficial uh, insects will die. Look at the residue from this uh, pesticide that remains in our crops and also in our soils. So the ones that remains in our crops will affect our health automatically. And at the same time, we are, uh, we are polluting our soils. So if we reduce the pesticide use, we will provide habitat for beneficial organisms. So let us encourage our farmers to manage the pests so that there is minimal use of pesticides, be it either organic or inorganic. Let us encourage minimal use of pesticides. The other strategy is to encourage farmscaping and biodiversity. 
Uh, Mr. Wafun has also talked about biodiversity, but I'll, I want us to look at our farmscaping. I know we've always gotten used to landscaping. Can we do the same to our farms? Like when we do the farmscaping, we shall be utilizing every available space. That is why you get to most of the organic farms, you'll even find flowers growing in the farm, planted deliberately to do the work. They will either attract pollinators or at the same time, the, the order from these crops would help us in uh, managing some of these pests. And at the same time, beauty is very important. Can you imagine at, at a farm that has been planned so well, skipping has been done, and you're able, you even enjoy it so therapeutic when you get to such a farm. So let us encourage our farmers to do farm skipping. And at the same time, let us encourage biodiversity. In biodiversity, I'm uh, talking about uh, different crops in the fields. And at the same time, let us integrate livestock in our farms for us to manage soil health. And finally, let us practice crop rotation. I know this is uh, achievable for our, our um, small scale farmers, but at the same time, it is very difficult for the same farmers, especially when they depend on a single crop for subsistence. For example, if uh, we need to encourage our farmers to do, it, to do several crops, if they depend on, for example, maize only as their stable food, that is when they'll, you'll find most of the farmers planting maize crops year round. But let us encourage our farmers to do diversity. This will also help us in, uh, in uh, as they do diversity, we will practice crop rotation and we'll have uh, food sovereignty. Like if you need uh, carbohydrates, you don't have, just need to, you don't have to use maize you can use sorghum, you can use even sweet potatoes. So it is important for us to practice, to train our farmers to practice crop rotation. In summary, I have talked about strategies that will help us attain and maintain soil health. Therefore, I want to remind all of us that most of our farmers depend on composting. But how is composting done? What, how is the timing? What are the quantities? How is it prepared? And what are the avail available nutrients in the compost? We, we need to do this deliberately. Let us ensure that we train on our farmers on proper timing so that by the time they are planting, they have ready compost. Let us also train them on the quantities required. Let us also train them on preparations. You know, composting has been taken as something that is uh, that can be done in Hauli, but really there are procedures. I'm not saying it is technical that uh, we need to have people going to school to do this, but I'm saying let us do the correct processes. And I know the next presenter will talk about it in details. Also, let us focus, I think as uh, organic practitioners, we've been challenged so many times by our brothers in the other sector, especially on availability of nutrients. What are the kind of crops that we use on our compost? That is able to provide, what else, what are the additive do we need to include in our compost heaps to ensure that we have the correct nutrients that we need? So as I have indicated, let us be so deliberate when doing this. And uh, finally, carbon belongs in the soil. So even as we choose on the crops to plant on our farms, let us consider on the crops that will help us in sinking carbon into the soil. For example, when, as we plant maize, let us consider other crops like sorghum, amaran, mention them. The list I know continues. And um, when we do this, we'll be able to take care of other environmental uh, components that otherwise our action would, uh, would affect. And uh, to that point, 
what I've been doing is sharing on strategies. And I will suffer this point to allow my brother continue from there so that we have time for question and answer. I have been your presenter, Grace Misoi, from Western part of Kenya. And it's been a pleasure having all of you today. I'm now handing over the program to our final presenter, Sam Derito. Kindly take over. Uh, thank you, Grace. I want to project on behalf of Mr. Derito and then uh, Mr. Derito, confirm if you're yes. online. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's morning. morning here. It's 11, 11. So, yeah, I'm here to present about composting. I hope that um, this will be able to help us to understand even more about soil fertilization strategies. And compost is one of the strategies that uh, we ought to teach our farmers to do uh, so that they, they get an alternative to chemical fertilization. So um, again, my name is Sam Deritu. I work for GBIAC, um, I'm a master trainer, and I welcome all of you to uh, listen to this very important topic. It's very short, but uh, very important. Composting as a, as, a, as a topic is very wide, but I've compressed it so that um, we are able to get a gist of what compost is and just very basic um, methods or ways of recycling materials that we, we harvest or we produce from our farms. And we are talking about zero waste and therefore nothing should be wasted. Whatever let's proceed. So what is compost? Compost is a fertilizer. It's an organic fertilizer that is made out of uh, the remains of materials, the remains of dead materials. Could be uh, animal, animal, dead animals, small animals, um, anything that can decompose. And then the final product is compost. And what's the goal? The goal is to maximize the quality of, and quantity of cured compost. When we talk about cured, you are talking about the end product that can be used directly now in the farm. So that's uh, the meaning of cured. And uh, so cured compost produced by unit, by unit area of the compost build and, the, and maximizes microbiodiversity. When you apply compost in your farm or in your soil, of course, what happens is that you maximize microbiodiversity because you add in a lot of organisms that are there in that compost. Compost appears in nature in several ways, three of them to be precise. And number one is in, in the form of manures. That is the farmyard manures. And you know, when a, a cow or an animal eats anything, there is some kind of fermentation that happens in the stomach. So the byproduct of, after the nutrients have been utilized in the body, the byproducts is the farmyard manure that has already been partially fermented inside the body of, of an animal, including human manure. We call it we call it human manure. That is very very important. And I by the way, the the best manure in the world is human manure. So if 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 we are, we are able, if we can accept, if we can ac accept, if our cultures can accept our manure that we produce, that can be the best way of fertilizing our soils. So that is one one form of um, um, composting, and definitely we have the second one, Pratemo. The second form of uh, compost is in form of dead plants, dead animals that decay, they drop on the surface of the ground, they decay on, and, and then that becomes uh, naturally fertilizer. And we can give an example of uh, the, the materials that drop in the, in the forests, and, and you know that this, the forest soils are very, very fertile. So that's another example. The other example is the roots that decay down there on the, on the, on the inside the, the, the soil. And the root hairs and the microbial life forms, um, you know, and all that. After you harvest, the plants that uh, remain down there, those are the roots. And that's very, very important. And therefore, we encourage farmers to not to, to, to burn the, the trash but they try to decompose the materials that uh, remain in the, in the 
in their farms. Functions. The functions of compost. Some photos of your farm. So you can copy them to your computer, put the parasite into it. The form of functions of, of compost. Number one, improves, improves the, the soil structure. It improves the soil st structure. Give it that lady there. Ah, improve the soil structure. Sorry for that. And it helps to break up clay. You know, clay, clay has, it has zero organic matter, but we have to improve the structures of all the soils that we have, be it sandy soils, be it clay soils. The soils that we have here at Gibia, they are very difficult to work with. If you are given the, so the, the one section of the soils that we have here at Gibia, you'll be, you'll run away because it's, 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 it's very, um, it's, it's very tricky. When it rains, it becomes very mushy. When it's dry, it becomes totally dry like a stone. So how do we improve that? You improve that by adding in organic matter in form of compost or in form of bokashi or in form of permeable manure. Um, and that, they, by that by that, you'll be improving the soil structure. Clay soils are neg have a negative charge. Clay soils have a negative charge. And for you to improve the, the reactions of clay soil, you have to add nutrients. And negative um, charges of clay will attract positive charges of nutrients. So, so it becomes a very good soil once you have added uh, the organic matter. Number two, it helps in moisture retention. Compost helps in, mo in moisture retention. The research that I've, I've done for the uh, quite a, a number of years shows me that a kilo of compost retains or holds six liters of water. So it, it retains um, water six times its weight. So if you have two kilos, it will retain uh, 12 liters of water. So it's, it's very, very important for, for you to, to really add in compost so that it helps in retaining retention of the little water that you have. Number three, Number three, it, it helps to improve aeration. Plants can obtain 96% of the nutrients they need from the air, the sun, and water. So a, a loose, healthy soil assists in diffusing air and moisture into the soil in exchanging nutrients. So that's very, very important. If, if you want oxygen inside your soil, you add in materials in form of compost. And here, it has to be cured materials, cured compost or cured farmed manure. Please don't add or farmers should never add materials or compost that has not been cured because that will bring in other challenges of um, decomposition, restarting again, and that will distract the ear uptake of nutrients by the plants. And number four, um, carbon dioxide release by organic matter decomposition diffuses out of the soil and is absorbed by the canopy of the of the leaves and and you know it forms what we call a mini climate down there so when you plant your crops and you're following the agroecological principles and the crops are doing very well the canopy up here helps to absorb co2 that's carbon carbon dioxide and it forms what we call a mini climate uh, at the surface and therefore that helps to also um retain water and prevents the sun from heating or burning the soil uh, directly, or even the rains hitting your, your, your soil and, and distracting uh, or what um, Grace was talking about, uh, soil traffic. So it, 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 it prevents soil traffic. Number five. Of course, now compost is a fertilizer. So it adds in nutrients in form of um, uh, exchange of nutrients. And there is a very important thing that we call CEC, uh, cut ion exchange capacity. And, and that is where the soil attracts because soil is negatively charged. So it attracts um, positively charged nutrients around it. 
and therefore it seeps the nutrients slowly by slowly. And that is very, very important because it has um, it, it brings in that element of, of fertilization and helping the plants to really acquire the nutrients that, that it needs. Proceed, Ratemo. Soil provides soil fertility. Soil provide, compost provides soil fertility. And a good compost that has been built very well using different materials helps in provision of, of, of elements. And a good plant, a plant, any plant that you have planted in your soils or your farm, requires at least 17 elements. A plant for it to do really well requires 17 elements. Three of the 17 elements, I call them HOC, H-O-C. And these are elements that um, are called non-minerals. They are plants, they are elements or nutrients that are acquired, um, the plants acquires from air and water. So you don't provide, it's not you to provide. The plant will just seek for them. Hawk is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Those three are gotten by the plant from the air and water. So it's, the, it's, it's just the plant that will get, get them. So those are three uh, non-mineral uh, elements that the plant just seeks for, the, for themselves. But the 14 elements that it remains, you as a farmer has to provide. You have to provide them because the plant will need them for, for that plant to really perform well. They are divided into three. Macronutrients, which is divided into two. Um, the, the macronutrients that are required in high amounts and macronutrients that are, are required in lesser amounts. NPK, um, which is um, the nutrients that are required in high amounts are very, very important for, for the plant. And, and every nutrient has its own function. So N and P um, helps in, in, in taking up and helps in digesting proteins and nucleic acids, which are important components in the plant tissues. K is mainly important in regulation of processes in the plant, such as osmosis, and enzyme activities. So it's generally playing an important role for quality and harvesting plant products, you know, and, and, and helps now the digestion, the uptake of, uh, of, 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 of nutrients. In the absence of NPK, it will bring other challenges of uptaking of macro, of uptaking of micronutrients. If K lacks in the, in the soil, some other micronutrients will, will also probably have a challenge in uptake. So it might be there, but um, it is locked. So it's important to make sure that you have tested your soils so that you understand what is there and, and what is lacking so that you can provide. So you, you must make sure that you provide um, the nutrients depending on the lack after soil testing. So a good farmer is the farmer that will test their soils. The other type of uh, macronutrients is calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Those ones are required in lesser amounts, not really in very little, but in lesser amounts, not like uh, NPK. And then we have micronutrients, the iron, manganese, boron, molyb molybdenum, uh, uh, copper, zinc, nickel, and, and chlorine or chloride, they're required in very small amounts. But every element there is very important for a plant. For you to say that, yeah, my maize is doing very well, all those elements should be there. I've talked of 17 elements, three are non-minerals, non 14 are minerals that you require, that the, soil, but the plant requires. And you have to add them in the soil, not for the plant. It is for the soil so that the plant takes them up. Pratemo? Next slide, please. All right, 
Compost contains organic matter, that one we know for sure. And then we say that humus, humus is like food that is on the table that you're eating right now. Humus is food that's on the table that you're putting in your mouth right now. But organic matter is the food that is in the straw. So humus will come from organic matter. Organic matter in a very good soil consists of 5% of the total, total um, composition of, of uh, the requirements in the soil. Normally, 45% of the total um, elements in the soil is water, is, is minerals, sorry. 25% is water, and then 5% um, is organic matter. But the 5% is the most important in, the, in, in that whole uh, circle, the 5% of organic matter. Because organic matter is the one that will provide minerals. Organic matter is the one that will help the soil to hold water. Organic matter is the one that will help to grow the food. And then out of the 5%, if you pull out 5% um, from that cycle, 80% is humus. And then 10% is the roots, and uh, another 10% is uh, uh, organisms or microorganisms. So 80% is humus. And I've said humus is the food that is being eaten right now by, uh, by the plant. It's just like you eating the food right now, but there is another food in the straw. So that's very, very important um, for us as, as farmers. But in Kenya, the best soils currently is about 2%. So we have a long way to go to fertilize our soils, to add in enough organic matter in our soils so that we say that uh, we are really doing something uh, so that we produce food sustainably. I've put something there in red, that the surface of, hum of humus particles carry negative electric charge. Many of the plant nutrients such as calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and, uh, and uh, micro, uh, micro elements or minerals carry positive charge. So the, the soil or manures or humus attracts, and that helps to hold nutrients in the soil. So that when the rains come, and uh, there is maybe a, a lot of rains, the humus, will help to hold nutrients so that they are not leached. So that is very, very important. Add, add, addition of humus or addition of organic matter in the form of compost is very, very important so that we, we help the soil to hold the nutrients that are there in the soil. Pratamo, continue. Yeah, so the processes or the process of making compost. For us to really have very good compost piles, for us to have very good compost, there are two major materials that we require, that we need. Some people will call them mature materials and immature materials. Those are major, major materials. Mature materials and number two, immature materials. Some people will say, Carbon, carbonaceous or carbon materials and nitrogen materials. And then some other people will say, we'll call, uh, we'll call them brown, brown, the browns or brown materials and green materials. But I would like us to use the term mature materials and immature materials as the major uh, components in making compost. So mature materials is refers to uh, materials that have already flowered. If a plant has not flowered, it is immature. A, flower, a plant that has flowered is immature. So if you have a lot of materials that have flowered or you have harvested, like maize tovers, um, maize stalks, like leaves from trees, like uh, stalks from sorghum or straws from millet, those are mature materials because you've already harvested the food. So that's one component that you require in the compost. And then immature materials, they're materials that have not flowered so that now they will contain nitrogen, all right? And then the other material that you need is um, uh, topsoil, preferably the fertile soil. And that is if you are in other soils apart from sandy soils and, and, and clay. 
So we don't recommend farmers to use clay soil in, in their compost. And we don't recommend farmers that are in sandy soils to, to apply the sandy soil, even if it's top, top soil in their compost. Because what we want to do is to improve the sandy soils and clay soils. So we don't put in again uh, top soil, even if it's sandy um, or, or clay on top of compost. But if you are in any other kind of soil, that is perfect. You can scoop the top soil and apply in your compost. And then you need water, you need kitchen wastes, not a must, but uh, it's, it's important. And then you make sure that the process of recomposition is oxygen-based decomposition. That is um, aerobic and not anaerobic. Proceed, Pratem. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about, carbon materials, nitrogen materials, mature materials versus immature, or browns versus, versus greens. And those are just examples of materials that are required. Uh, maize stalks, uh, dried leaves, bean trash, sorghum stems, millet straws, uh, sawdust from indigenous trees, so, sawdust from indigenous trees, not eucalyptus, not, not um, cypress. So it has to be indigenous trees. And then if you have peanut shells, you have egg, um, you know, uh, any plant-based materials that are already harvested, those are in that section or side of carbon or mature or browns. And then we have immature plant materials. We have fresh garden weeds. We have manures from herbivorous animals. Manures from herbivorous animals. Those are uh, poultry, cows, goats, and not, not donkeys, not dogs, not cats. And then it is tea bugs that you are, tea, the, uh, the, you know, the tea bugs that uh, after you have taken your tea, those are very important. Coffee grounds and filters, uh, kitchen scraps, they are on the side of nitrogen or greens. Yeah, so those are the kind of, but you still, you can still add the, on, on the list other materials, as long as you understand what they provide. Will they provide nitrogen or will they provide carbon in, uh, in, in your compost? Ratemo? It's very, very important for farmers to understand that the crops that they grow in their farms, if they are really agroecological farmers, they should base their farming system on agroecological system that's called 60, 30, 10. That is 60% of the total area should be planted under compost crops. Compost crops are also re referred to as food crops. These are crops that capture a lot of carbon um, that is in the, in the air. You know, carbon is not required to stay in the air because it destroys the, 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 the environment. It destroys, is the one that, that uh, has brought all these challenges of, of climate change. And um, yeah, um, so you, they need to understand which crops are they growing in their farms so that it gives them materials for making, for making compost. Compost crops are examples I, I think I gave out yesterday, maize, sorghum, um, we have uh, millet, we have uh, uh, amaranthus, those are the sunflower can still fall, fall under that. Um, yeah, those are some of the examples of, of compost crops or carbon crops. And through their roots, they are able to capture a lot of carbon and then when you have those crops and you have taken the food away, you, you return back carbon in the soil in the form of um, compost. But the best carbon crop in the world is called Jerusalem artichoke. Jerusalem artichoke. It's a vegetable. A vegetable that captures massive amounts of carbon. And so it's important for us to understand all these types of the dynamics of uh, making compost, um, good piles, what do they need? What do they contain? What are the elements that you need in your compost? Uh, so that when you're applying compost in your soil, you, you, you know, you, of course, you'll be knowing that um, you apply the nutrients that are required by the plants. And again, it depends on what kind of plants that you're growing. There are plants that elements. So, Heavy feeders, of course, requires a lot of nitrogen. So when you're making a compost that you want to plant maize with or sorghum or millet, definitely you will make sure that that pile is rich in nitrogen. 
And then later I'll be talking about the, the types of compost that we have. Ratemo? Yeah, there are things that you need to avoid in the compost pile. You need to avoid um, uh, meat products or animal products like meat, bones, milk, uh, dairy products, fats and oils, uh, pet feces, that's the dogs, cats, and, and carnivorous like donkeys. Wood ashes, uh, put there a question mark, wood ashes. We will have be able, be able to discuss that later. And then um, any other like um, eucalyptus leaves, uh, cypress leaves, all those, you need to avoid them in your pile. Maybe just to discuss uh, wood ashes. I said yesterday that if your soils are already alkaline, please do not, do not use ashes, either in your pile or sprinkling the ash in your farm. You have to test your soils first to determine what is the level of alkaline or acidity in your soil. So if your soil is acidic, and I said acidity levels is, for me, is five and below, then wood ash would really assist you. But if your, your, your soil is alkaline from, say, six and above, then you don't need ashes in your soils because you'll destroy your soil because the more the alkaline in your soil is or it will be, then again, the poor that soil is. All right, proceed, Ratemo. So there are three major stages of compost decomposition, three major stages. And this is we're going a little bit deeper in, 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 in the composition of composting. Yeah? So the first stage is called mesophilic stage, mesophilic stage. And that is where materials start to ferment. And they start fermenting in the third day, depending on the type of compost that you're making. So if uh, the type of compost that decomposes very quickly is called hot compost, decomposition starts in the third day. If the comp is the compost that de starts the decomposition process in, a, in, a, in seven days, the decomposition, the fermentation starts, you know, very slowly. So mesophilic stage is a stage where the, my, the my bacteria, known as the mesophiles, are attracted and they come into your pile and they start the work of decomposition. And the temperatures of uh, your pile is pushed from zero to around 40 degrees Celsius. Quite warm, not so bad. So that the fermentation will have started and uh, you, you'll see signs of decomposition because if the pile was 1.5 meters high, it will drop to around one meter. So half a meter will, will drop. And, and so you'll, you'll start looking at and, or seeing that the pile is decompo decomposing. And so when you dip in the, 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 um, the thermometer or the thermo stick and then pull this out, you'll feel that the, the pile is, is quite warm. Uh, so this is a stage where the materials start breaking down and the mesophiles breaks down soluble and readily de uh, degradable compounds like sugars and starches. So meso the mesophiles, their work is to, is to eat up or to break down sugars and starches. Stage number two. Stage number two is called thermophilic stage. Thermo means hot. Thermo is something that is hot. So, so um, it is where the, 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 the mesophiles are pushed away because the compost has become a little bit hotter, more than 40 degrees Celsius, and now they pave way uh, for the, the thermophiles. Now, who, the, 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 the bacteria that starts a lot of breaking down of fats and proteins, and they push the temperatures from 40 degrees to around 70 degrees Celsius. That's quite hot. And, and so they break down the, the cellulose and hemicellulose, and they now start building up of humus. And, and uh, so that's why now you, you can dip in your hand and come out with broke, already broken materials. And you cannot understand the type of materials that you had used in making that compost. So that's the second stage. It's called the thermophilic stage where thermophiles do the work of decomposition. And then the third stage, third stage, it goes back to the mesophilic stage. The, the thermophiles will die 
because already they have eaten up all the uh, proteins and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and the proteins and the fats, they have broken them down, so they lack something to eat. And therefore, the heat goes down. So when the heat goes down, they pave way to the mesophiles. They come back again. And now, this time round, they start now eating up the materials that had remained and the temperatures cool down so that now the pile is ready for use. This can go up to eight months, depending on the type of materials that you have, you have used. If the materials have a lot of um, woody parts, woody stems, the, the lignin is in big amounts, it's in large amounts, the, the pile will take longer to decompose. It will take up to eight months. And that kind of compost is called cold compost. It takes a lot of time to decompose. Uh, and then so now, after the pile is ready for use, and you don't use that compost then, another stage will come in, which is an additional stage. It's not a stage per se, but it's an additional stage. It is called mineralization stage. And this is where the mesophiles lack the food to eat, and so they start eating up your, your nutrients. So if they start breaking up or breaking, burning up, oxidizing the, the, the minerals. Um, and, and so it's kind of your pile starts being destroyed by the mesophiles. So what you do to avoid this stage is that when the pile is ready, when the compost is ready for use, you spread your compost. You spread it so that it, it, it becomes very cold. And then when it becomes very cold, the mesophiles automatically, they will die and they will not lack something to eat. And then your, your, the, the compost becomes very dry and then you can bring it together. And then you have, make sure that you avoid your compost from being rained on. And then also uh, make sure that the compost is not hit by the sun directly. But again, you can put, you can save your, 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 your compost, the ready compost. Now, this is what you call cured compost. You can save it in the, in the, in the, in the sacks or somewhere in your store, and then you can use it wherever, whenever time that you want. So let us avoid mineralization stage. This is where the mesophile eats up or oxidizes or burns up your pile, or it eats up the nutrients. So that's what we call mineralization. So that's, I'm showing there's stages there in a graphic way. It starts with mesophiles, goes to the mophilic stage, and then the curation um, and maturation stage, that's the mesophiles, goes back to the first stage. And, and we need to understand all these levels so that uh, we, we have the, a good end product, product of, of, of the compost. Any compost pile that you pile today, if you had, say, um, one ton of materials, if you pile one ton of materials, the end product of cured compost will be 44% the total now of the cured compost will be 44%, around there, around 44%. But again, depends on the materials that you have used. If you use a lot of succulent materials, and that's the hot compost, it will be around 10% of the total cured compost. But a good pile is called cold compost. And we'll be looking at that as, as I finish. Continue, Ratamu. Yeah, troubleshooting, maybe your, 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 your compost is not decomposing, you wonder why, uh, that we call that troubleshooting, that maybe materials are not decomposing, you add water. Or you can turn the pile to add in oxygen. Or you can eat, add in more greens or more succulent materials. So your pile will start again. That is number one. Number two, if your pile is producing ammonia, ammonia gas, then it means that your compost is not decomposing. It is rotting, it is rotting up. So you add in carbonaceous materials, um, materials like, uh, like straws, like um, leaves, you, you incorporate, incorporate them, you restart again the pile. Or if the compost is, is, is rotten, it, it producing very bad smell, like a toilet. It means that you need to turn up the pile or add in other materials that are dry or coarse or mature materials. So that's in case, your pile is not decomposing. Know that there's some, some problem inside there. Yeah. And again, proceed Ratemo, again, if you dip in the stick, there's a thermostick, or the, um, you dip in the, 
what we call uh, a thermometer and it comes out with some white stuff, it means that there's a problem in your pile. That problem is fungal. That's a disease of the compost. It's called fire fungus. Those are fungus. It's a, it's a, it shows that it's, there's no decomposition taking place. So that disease is cured by either turning the pile, number one, or two, adding in water. So that now you avoid that, pile, that, that, uh, that kind of a, of, a, of a scenario. Number two, if you are turning the pile and you find that uh, materials are, 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 touch, are holding one another, like maybe you, you, you use grass and you, you find that the, the, the kind of materials are holding one another like a mattress, you know, again, that that is not decomposition. That is something different. So you need to turn it very well, add in green materials and add water. So now again, decomposition will kick start. Three types of compost as I finish. Three types of compost. One, hot compost. Hot compost is a compost where you are using a lot of immature materials and very little of very little of mature materials. So it means that immature materials are more double than mature materials. So that is called hot compost. It means that decomposition will be very quick because the, 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 the decomposition will, 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 um, um, will attract a lot of bacteria and micro and macroorganisms that will do a lot of quick decomposition. And that is not good. Quick decomposition means poor compost or poor final product. Again, I repeat, quick decomposition means poor final product or poor uh, cured compost. Compost number two is called warm, warm compost. And that is why you use 50, 50, 50 of mature and 50 of immature materials. And, and so the, the decomposition will be moderate around between three months and six months. Hot compost will take up to three months. Warm compost will take for, uh, up to six months to decompose. That is not a very bad type of compost. I can still recommend, but the type of compost that I recommend is called cold compost. The type of compost that takes long to decompose, but it has a lot of lignin materials, a lot of organic matter. And when you apply that in the soil, the, 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 the be slower as opposed to um, hot compost. I would uh, take this an example of um, you eating um, when you are very hungry, you are totally hungry, and then you take glucose or a soda or a, some juice. It will reduce your hunger at once. But you'll stay for about another 10 minutes or 20 minutes, that hunger will come back. And then a person that eats ugali and meat and some sukuma, that person will stay for a very long time without getting back into hunger. So that's a, just a simple example of hot compost and cold compost. So it's always good to advise farmers on how to make this compost. But the most important thing would be if a farmer has farmyard manure, I would not recommend them to make compost because if they have a cow and they have produced maize and they have maize tovers or maize, maize stalks, they'll feed their animals rather than making compost using um, those materials. So it will not be logical to tell farmers to make compost, yet they have a cow or have, they have some goat. So let them feed their animals using those materials. And then the farmyard manure that will be produced it will be improved using the remainder of other materials. And then now they mix together. As I said yesterday, it makes what we call a boma compost. But if a farmer don't, doesn't have um, an animal, like cacao or goats, then that's when we recommend them to make compost so that now they have an alternative of fertilizing their soils. We call that fertilization strategies. One of them is compost, farmed manure, you have bokashi and the rest. And, and so that now, um, they avoid the use of chemicals. I'm not sure whether I have another slide, slide Ratemo. 
yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to take the session to Grace to conduct a question and answers. So please, are uh, all the trainers online? Any of you will respond to the questions. Thank you, Ratemo. Indeed, all the experts in the room will take the questions. I'm going to start with the one uh, question from um, Elfas is asking, is it okay to use human manure? Is it ethically okay to use human manure? Anybody can take this, but I know when the Rita would love to say something about I'll, I'll it. Respond. Yeah, I'll respond yes. to that. Yes. Human manure is called human manure. Human manure is the best manure in the world. If you go to some countries like China, <laughs> if you go to um germany and some other countries i've seen i've seen some i've seen them writing on the on the road that please leave your manure here that means that you go there you leave your toilet there because so they know the it ethically okay it is, is it is it is it is because but now it depends on the culture if the culture does not allow then um yeah but human manure is the best if fully decomposed fully cured, you can never know whether it was human manure. Yeah, thank you. I would like, like to add on to that, uh, Mr. Derito. Um, most of the people, especially in the West, and this has been adapted in, uh, in Kenya by some, some people who are now recycling the, the human waste into manure and they are growing their own food I tell you, apart from, unless you know there is uh, any human waste that is being used in that farm, you may not actually know who, or whether they are using animal manure or not. Um, most of the people tend to think that human manure is bad because of um, the nature of, um, of us people. We don't want to be associated with our own, our own uh, dropping. So um, for me, I will say like Mr. Derito, they are very, very good but let, um, cure them properly and uh, let people know it's being used and it is a matter of time that everybody will adapt it. Thank you. So maybe a, a short uh, addition, uh, human manure is used and can be used and is good, but depends on how you handle it um, because it can, uh, when, it, when, when it's just released, it can, uh, be subjected to pathogens. So um, we have what we call compost toilets uh, for human manure. And uh, these are the de uh, special designs for that. And uh, it has to cure for uh, at least uh, six months before, before use. And then, uh, I mean, give it time and then uh, have appropriate designs for uh, handling. Because and then there's the issue about culture, as Nderito has uh, said. But uh, I think through education and this kind of forum, uh, people can overcome uh, some of these uh, cultural barriers. Sawa. Asante Ferdinand. Another question uh, from Felista is she wanted to know the difference between uh, manure and fertilizer. Anyone can take this? Come up again, Chris. The difference between manure and fertilizer. <laughs> manure, <laughs> fertilizer, fertilizer is a, is a general term. Fertilizer is a general term. It's anything that fertilizes. So there's no difference. We can say chemical fertilizer. You can say, say animal, animal fertilizer. You can say compost fertilizer. So, so fertilizer is just a general term that describes anything that can fertilize, either chemical or organics. So manure is a type of fertilizer. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, so no, it's, somebody... it's good, just short, sir. Manure is um, the droppings from animal sources, sir. The organic stuff from animal sources is called manure. We can talk about um, cattle manure, goat manure, sheep manure, 
bat manure, another word for uh, bat manure is usually called guano. And the fertilizer is actually the, the addition of nutrients. We talk about the additives, the nutrients. We specifically are talking about availability of uh, nutrients through fertilization. Thank you, Ferdinand. The other question is um, from Biwot is asking, what is the, what happens when we use undecomposed materials in the farm? I tend to imagine he meant um, disposing and decomposed materials in the farm, or uh, it could be compost that is not ready. So undecomposed materials, what are the effects on the farm? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's good to uh, know why you are doing what. And uh, if you have a lot of um, organic matter or materials now you will have to design and use them as mulch for example they will, that would become more useful and um, when you just uh, throwing them and 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 having them on uh, on your farm they are not uh, um, of ready use uh, if you are to plant crops there because they will have to go uh, in a process of decomposition which has been explained here by the ritual and uh, grace and uh, that would be of no use, but it's good to um, be intentional in terms of how you design, how to recycle these materials so that uh, you don't want to waste a lot of your energy just throwing things out there, but a uh, uh, planned uh, uh, kind of recycling of your materials, either through a compost pile or through mulching, and uh, that is intentional. Thank you. The other question, uh... I think I need to ask uh, to Esther to respond to this, to this. I know you'll be handling this later, but it has been asked. Do organic pesticides kill or, or uh, repel pests? I think that is for uh, tomorrow, maybe, and it's a whole uh, subject. I'm sure Dr. Nderitu and Dr. Nehemiah would uh, maybe just to hold on. Uh, maybe that will be for tomorrow, but maybe just something related to that that uh, is important for us to know is about, uh, we talked about microbes and we have those that are pathogenic and non-pathogenic. So those pathogenic are the ones that, that cause diseases to even humans and to, to crops and even to animals. And uh, when we do um, um, composting and, and consider uh, some of those factors, we actually suppress pathogenic uh, um, 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 organisms uh, and promote, uh, I mean, we, we suppress non-pathogenic and promote pathogenic. When we have more um, non-pathogenic um, uh, microbes, then we in, in, ensure that we have healthy soils and we also have healthy plants and even healthy people. Thank you, Ferdinand. Someone, someone is also asking, I, this is Beatrice, the Rito, he's, she's asking the meaning of coarse materials. Coarse materials are the hardy, uh, the, the woody parts, the, the parts that are, take longer to decompose, like uh, mm -hmm. twigs, like branches, the ones that we start um, in the pile, the ones that we lay down on the pile down there, they are called uh, coarse materials. They take longer to decompose. And then you have soft, mat uh, dry materials, the ones that decompose quickly. Thank you, Sam. The other question from uh, Galmaga, how will you rank different manure from different livestock species in terms of nutrient quality? I think it depends on uh, what the farmer is looking for. Mm -hmm. But the way I rank my manure is that chicken manure is always, that is in, in terms of nitrogen content, chicken manure is, is number one. I think number two, I can go to rabbits and then pigs. And then um, I can go to shorts. Shorts are sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And then I can go to livestock the cows. So cows have, uh, uh, that's according to me, uh, have the least amount of nitrogen. 
Maybe, maybe not. Let's test the manures if you want to use it. Good answer, Mr. Anderito. Uh, do you manure, yes, yes. manure is, yes? Yeah, just a short interjection. I, I am sure we are um, winding up huh? and uh, we have Rosina here. Uh, she yeah. just wants to, 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 to say hi and just wish everybody well. Hi, everyone. Good to meet you. Hi, Rosina. Uh, today I've come to see uh, Ferdinand here at Bioji. I would have loved to join and follow, but I'm sure that we are all learning. And I'm sure we can continue the discussion even beyond this, but I'm happy to see all of you actively engaging. Wonderful. All the best. Thank you. Rosina. Thank you. I think these are among the final questions now. I think you, Manua, is raising a lot of uh, discussion online. And I have uh, two questions. One Dominic is asking, is Larry from Human Waste Biogas Digester used to make human manure? The other question in relation to that is from Naina. Annie, she's asking, in, hum in human manure, how can we control the smell? Anyone can check that? You. Um... There is what we call, call a toilet compost, mm -hmm. toilet compost. So when, when uh, you relieve yourself in, in toilet composts, it's normally added um, sawdust, and you know sawdust is, a, is, a, is, a, is carbon, it's carbon materials. So once you, 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 you relieve yourself, the rule is that you, you apply sawdust or ashes. So you'll continue like that until the, the, the bin is, is, is full, and then you remove that bin, and then you decompose it. After decomposition, you can hold that manure uh, using your hands, and you'll never under know whether it was your manure. It was your mm -hmm. store. So, so the controlling of, uh, of smell is by adding in um, sawdust or ashes. Thank you, Sam. Something short about uh, smell. Mm. You know, we have what we call odor. And uh, for example, when you have uh, materials that are actually producing uh, odor, uh, you know, this is actually uh, the accumulation of uh, the ammonia and pathogenic um, 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 bacteria. Uh, it is good not to use uh, those pathogenic. If you re realize that your, uh, your your compost is producing odor, then you have more pathogenic uh, materials uh, there. It's also always good, I think, as um, um, and Derek pointed out, when you're using fresh uh, materials, then you are reducing uh, uh, the pathogenic uh, uh, materials. And uh, remember when I, in my presentation, I said that uh, all these uh, plants that we use uh, have an association with, um, with some uh, microbes. And so when you are starting the composition, it is the same microbes that are actually starting that process. But when they are contaminated with, um, with the other and then plant materials, for example, where you have a dead um, a cat or, or a rat, and you have a lot of that, then you will have a lot of the pathogenic uh, bacteria and microorganisms uh, in your compost. But if there are very few, uh, little, just very little, then the, um, the non-pathogenic will suppress the pathogenic ones and uh, you will have just very good. Because we, we should be aware that uh, we have both the pathogenic and non-pathogenic uh, um, uh, microbes in our surrounding. And the reason why we do not we do not have those odors or we do not have um, diseases everywhere is because the good bacteria or the good microbes uh, actually suppress uh, the bad ones. And we can compare this with the people in society. If we have many bad people in a certain community, then you have a lot of robbing, you have robbers, you have so many things there. <laughs> but if you have many good people, 
then that is a place that uh, is, is peaceful and you have all those uh, good virtues. So that is how the microbial world uh, also also exists. Thank you. Yeah, in, in, addition, in addition to what Father is saying, <clears throat> if you have a, a toilet compost, you have to separate urine from the stool if you want to reduce on odors, because urine is the one that brings in almost, almost all, all, all this, all this uh, smell. So, so um, the, the toilet compost is made in a way that uh, it separates urine and the stool, if you want to really uh, use the human manure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I think uh, I have seen your hand, uh, Mumu, I'll give you a chance. But before I get to you, I think uh, Ratemo, you need to take note of this. Somebody is asking about a uh, vermicompost. I know we do not have time to talk about it right now, but maybe it's something to note. In the next uh, refresher, maybe we can talk about it, vermicompost. And finally, allow me to, uh, to read one more question from our brother from Rwanda, Anaste Ruabizanguaya. He's asking, how do you know the right manure to use? I know some you can answer this, the right the, manure. The, yeah, yeah. Everything, everything goes around into testing. Mm -hmm. Because even if you have a very good compost and you don't understand your soil, so it's always good for you to test both. Test your soil and then you have tested your, your manure you take your, your, your soils or your, your manure to, to the lab and test them so that you, you understand what do they contain and what is your, your soil lacking. Because now if I, if I say I will use uh, chicken manure, what does it contain and what is my soil lacking? So all manures are good depending on how they have been uh, made and the materials that have made them. But again, it revolves around soil tests and manure testing. Thank you, Sam. I know questions will still be coming up. Maybe we can still uh, follow up later, Atemo. But allow me to give a chance to Mumo. Mumo, ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Grace. Now, actually, my questions were in the chat. So I just wanted to know that you can look at them so that they can be answered. Please ask now that you have a chance. I think it was um, it was a question of the issue of the bioslurry from the biodigesters, um, because you know sometimes we put both animal and human waste so that they can it can go to the bioslurry. So I didn't hear anything about the, the any discussions about bioslurry, and what the components are, and then secondly, um, do we need to test? Sorry, do we need to test the bioslurry? At the, as, a, as an organic farmer, so that they, it can, when it has been put, when it is being put in the in the in the in the in the soil, because I know some standards require that uh, you test your 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 organic the the compost. Yeah. All right, Sam, I think you had started answering. Continue. Sam, are you in? Or Esther, can you answer the bioslurry question? I don't think they are online, but uh, maybe you can attempt it about uh, bioslurry. Kindly, what was the question again? Bioslurry, the, compon the components of the bioslurry in the He's basically asking about uh, the bioslurry. Yes, um, it's okay to use bioslurry when you are uh, composting uh, as part of green materials uh, because mm -hmm. it contains high levels of nitrogen. Uh, um, would be good instead if you do not have the, um, the green leaves, uh, you can uh, combine the bioslurry with the rough or coarse materials uh, in your compost and then mm -hmm. of course have some soil. Thank you, Ferdinand. Actually, Maybe, I don't know, sir. Grace, I yes. think there's something that's not clear. Yes. What I wanted to know is 
you it's already digested in the biodigester in the mm -hmm. biogas so you have mm -hmm. to put it again in the compost again i thought we are allowed to put it directly on the farms for and then now you can continue on with that because that's what i wanted to know because of the testing do we need to test bio slurry because some standards require um like global gap and the uh, global gap they require that you test your organic matter thank you let me to attempt to that mm -hmm. question uh the first part of your question is bio slurry can be used especially for fodder it can be used for fodder but I want you to note that even though it, the, the, it has started the process, the fermentation process just started in the biodigester, but it is not fully composed. So that is why we put it as component in, in, our, in our compost, but at the same time, it can be used. But again, look at the pathogens. Are we sure that we've killed all the pathogens in the process of digesting? Because during that time, we were only interested with the gas. So did the temperatures re reach the required uh, levels to kill all the pathogens? That is really the importance of using, um, of continuing the process of composting. But I know it is allowed to be used in um, fodder. But testing is also very important, especially because of the pathogens, the standards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Grace, thank you. I'm, I'm back. My power got lost, but I'm back. Now, uh, okay. it's, it's, it's very, very important for us to understand that uh, the biosilary has taken very short time in the unit. Yes. And then it comes out as, as silary. So how sure are we, what as Grace has said, and especially, especially if you have used uh, human, human waste in, in the, in the mm -hmm. biodigester? How sure are you that the pathogens are killed? And you know, it takes quite a long, long time before the pathogens die. So you need to really um, uh, ferment because it's already, it's, it's uh, watery. You need to really ferment it fully. Yeah. If you are not fermenting it, uh, use it in the compost pile yeah. so that you will now be sure yeah. that the yeah. pathogens are really, um, they, are, they are dead. So, but I've said that I, I would recommend long-term plants, like uh, napier grass, like fruit trees, like, you know, such kind of crops, but not three months, four months crops. Mm -hmm. But it's always good to, to test. It's always good to test anything that you, are, that you are using. And especially when you're using the, the human waste, it's good to test to see whether, and if, if the crops or the yield or the products are to be exported. It's good to test for, for pathogens. I, I'm still questioning the same because in the biodigester, when you're when that thing takes forever to cook as gas, it can take even, even two, three months. So my question is by the time it is becoming bio slurry, it doesn't come out as bio. I mean, it doesn't come out immediately. It takes, I mean, if you have a biogas unit, it almost takes four months, three months for as you put in the stuff because of the of the continuous production of gas, because that's where the heat is. So when the bioslurry is being removed and it goes to where it's supposed to be put for it to be baked, and this is what I wanted to know, is is it necessary for you to add um, the the what is it called the, the the brown matter after that? Because of again, you are going to take it through another five months. So when are you ever going to put anything in the chamber for you for the soil to be tested and no, for the not, same not to be tested? It is not a must. It is not a must that you put it again in the compost pile. It is not a must. But the, the, the overflow, which you call, you call the, now the, the biosillary. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. I would recommend that, that you have a pit somewhere where it goes in and it stays, stays there uh, for another maybe one or two months. After that's what I'm asking. Yeah. That is what I'm asking. Yeah. When it is already in the pit, it can be used directly. Plus, on top of that, do we need to test it? That's a question. Yes, we need to test it. Yes. We need to test it for pathogens and test it for, for the nutrients. Because already, uh, I, I think it doesn't have a lot of nutrients. It doesn't have a lot, a lot of nutrients. It has high amounts of uh, nitrogen mm -hmm. because most of the nutrients have been used, have been converted into, into gas. So we need to test also to understand what is it that it contains. I know it contains a lot of nitrogen and that's why we recommend napier grass because napier grass is a heavy, heavy feeder. We recommend uh, fruit trees because well, trees are also heavy feeders. Yeah, so that now, yeah, I would recommend a, a test. And especially 
if you, are, you have used human manure? Well, I think from the literature that is available online, I think uh, it says it's one of the best and it can be poured on vegetables. And I've seen, I think I've seen somebody who's using it and they're having amazing products on their farm. Um, I don't think the, there's much, because by the time it's like, you now what you're saying, put in sand and all those things, because it's not allowed in the biodigester. I think it has already done its thing and I think it's the best. Probably, I don't know where the confusion in terms of the literature that is available is. Thank you anyway. All right, Momo, that is the discussion that can, can continue. And actually people can start researching on the same. I think it's one area that we need to put a lot of emphasis. Otherwise, I know our time is up. Most of the trainers are getting to other engagements. I'm returning the program officially to you, Ratemo. Yes, thank you, uh, Grace. Thank you, Mr. Deritu. Thank you, our participants. We have taken note of some of the discussion, for example, vermiculture and biodigester. So we are going to organize other series of online meetings to now deliberate on that. So thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.